Everyone, put your hands together and welcome David Suzuki. What you didn't say, Charlene, is my father loved you like a daughter, remember? He, he thought very... He, my dad was in an episode of The Beachcombers, and he met, uh, he met Charlene there when she was a little girl. I'm delighted to be here today, and I guess this is Slaywood to the territory, is it? I keep using all three of you guys and figuring out there must be lots of battles going on to see. <laughs> but it is an, uh, a delight to be here on traditional territory of people who cared for it for thousands of years, and we should remember and think about that. Ever since Stephen Harper became our Prime Minister, I'm afraid I have had to preface my remarks by saying I am not speaking tonight on behalf of any organization like the David Suzuki Foundation, any, any political party like the Greens, any corporation, or uh, any group. I'm here speaking as an individual scientist, as a grandfather, and as an elder. As, a, as an individual, as a scientist, I say, you know, people ask me, are you optimistic or pessimistic? And I say, I'm realistic. You know, I can see where the, the trend lines are, and uh, I know that what uh, Sephora said is true. The revolution is happening, but we're down in that very, very low part where what seems to be a doubling seems fantastic, but it's down so low, it's going to take a while to really uh, ramp up and become very, very significant. But uh, what I do say also as a scientist is no one, and many of my colleagues are now saying, we've passed too many critical points that uh, it's too late, especially on an issue like climate change. And my response to that as a scientist is, you can't say that. We don't know enough to say it's too late. It's urgent, yes, but you can't say it's too late. And I, that's not a Pollyanna-ish kind of, oh, don't worry, good things are going to happen. It's based on on fact, uh, you all know that the, the most prized species of salmon in the world is the sockeye salmon. That's a bright red oily flesh that we all love to eat. And the biggest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River. And you all remember, if you care about sockeye, 2009, when we had a disastrous drop in salmon to just over a million animals. And we like to have it up around 20 to 30 million. And I remember vividly turning to my wife and saying, that's it. They've had it. They, there isn't the biomass to get them up to the spawning beds. Uh, the sockeye are, are, are going. And a year later, you all recall, we got the biggest run of sockeye in 100 years. Now, I use that not to show how stupid I am. Nobody knows what the hell happened. I mean, the Cohen Commission looked at it. We don't know what happened. Nature surprised us. And I believe that there are many more surprises in store, not all of them pleasant. But if we can pull back and give nature a chance, I believe she will be far more forgiving than we deserve. And that's what gives me the hope to keep going on. We don't know enough to say it's too late, but it is very, very urgent. As a, as a grandfather, of course, I know for a fact that my grandchildren will not know anything like the world that I grew up in. I was born in Vancouver in 1936, and I vividly remember jigging with my dad for halibut off Spanish banks. We could go down to the mouth of the Fraser River and catch sturgeon any time we wanted. You remember there were oolicans that ran all up. They used to run along Stanley Park. The world is, and my, my children had no, I, no memory of the fact that there used to be a Vancouver Sun Salmon Derby when people would just go out here and catch salmon and win big prizes. That was canceled over 30 years ago because the salmon aren't there. I know the world I took for granted as a child isn't there for my grandchildren. And I think that's been an abrogation of responsibility that every generation has had. I, um, as an elder, this is the most important time of my life. Because elders aren't running after money anymore, or fame, or, or power, or even sex. I mean, we're past, we're past that now, right? We don't have to play games or pull our punches in order to get a job or a promotion or a raise. 
We can speak the truth from our hearts. And if that offends people, that's their problem, not mine. That's, and, and elders have something no other group in society has. We've lived an entire life. We've made mistakes. We've suffered failures. We've celebrated successes. We've learned a lot. And those are life lessons that really we owe it to the coming generations to pass on what we've learned uh, in, in our lifetime. I keep thinking that there should be a group of company presidents and CEOs, greens, grays for green. Now they're out of the system. Tell us the truth. Tell us what you learned while you were still in that system. And so I believe this is the most important uh, time in my life and I tell my fellow elders get the hell off the couch get off the golf course get on with the most important part of your life and that's why I'm here uh, this evening you see we are at a critical point in all of human history we are now the major force altering the properties of the planet the physical chemical and biological properties of the planet on a scale unprecedented. No other species has had the ability to change the planet as we are doing within a very, very short period of time. That's why scientists call this the Anthropocene Epoch, a period in time when we are the dominant force now altering the properties of the planet. And that's, um, that position has come about by the sudden conjunction of a number of factors. One, of course, is population. We now are the most numerous mammal on the planet. There have never been uh, as many mammals on this planet as there are human beings. And of course, we're, every year we're adding almost three times the population of Canada to the global population every year. <coughs> and every addition has to be fed, clothed, and sheltered, have to, has to drink water and eat food. We have a big ecological footprint. It takes a lot of air, water, and land to keep us alive. But of course, we're not just like a rat or mouse or a rabbit. We have an enormous amount of technology used on our behalf. And technology that we all look to now, oh, technology is going to pull us out of this. Technology has enabled us to use the entire planet as a source of raw materials. Technology is one of the driving forces that has amplified our ecological footprint beyond anything uh, imaginable a hundred years ago. And ever since World War II, we've been driven by an incredible appetite for stuff. A survey uh, in the United States um, among teenage girls a few years ago uh, found that 98% of teenage girls consider shopping their number one recreation. So I guess you get your exercises as, as well as uh, uh, getting your kicks. And I can't tell you to be, you know, my parents got married during the Great Depression. And that really scarred them. It shaped the way they looked at the world. And because of their experience in the Depression, they just banged home over and over again. They said, live within your means. Save some for tomorrow. Share, don't be greedy. Help your neighbor, you may one day need their help. You have to work hard to earn the money to buy the necessities in life. But you don't run after money or stuff as if having more makes you a, a better, more important person. And, uh, but today, the entire economy that we look to is based primarily on consumption. And I don't think anything illustrates this madness of our consumption than People who pay hundreds of dollars to buy a brand new pair of blue jeans that is already ripped. It makes me sick. It makes me sick to look at this because what is it doing? It's flaunting our, our wealth and saying, I don't give a shit about the planet. I'm going to, and I guess it's supposed to look good, but just to be fashionable, it says nothing about using things over, about recycling. It's, it's to me the, the ripped blue jeans are the symbol of what is really wrong uh, about society today. I hope nobody here is wearing, uh, wearing those jeans. Because uh, I did say it once and I saw this woman kind of... Anyway, it's just a little pet peeve of mine, that's all. Um, 
We, um, and of course, the global economy now is driving all countries uh, to, for greater growth. And uh, when you add all of this together, our numbers, our, our technological power, our consumption, and the global economy, that is why we have become the driving force in the age of the Anthropocene. I'd like to just give you some personal background to look at the, the evolution of where I am today. I spent eight years in the United States getting an education that wasn't possible back in those days between 1954 and 1962. And I came back to Canada because I didn't want to live. This is a time when the US was going nuts in science. Remember, Sputnik was launched in 1957. And the Americans said, we got to catch up. And it was wonderful. I mean, even though I was a Canadian, if you said, I like science, they threw money at you. I mean, it was a glorious time. But I decided I didn't want to stay in the United States. I wanted to come home. Not because Canada was a better country, but it was different. And I preferred the differences. To me, Can Canadians didn't run after money the way the Americans seemed to worship money. Uh, to me, Canada meant that Tommy Douglas could become a a number one icon in this country, that, that Medicare was not something that was a, uh, something hatched by communists, that the CCF, well now it's the NDP, uh, uh, was a legitimate party that was voted for f by a large number. To me Canada meant the National Film Board, it meant Quebec and the CBC, and all of those things were what I preferred to have and I came back to Canada in 1962. And I was a hot shot geneticist. Man, I was gonna make my reputation and I, I was all set to, to leap into the fray and um, I got totally sidetracked by a woman. <laughs> now, what can I say? It's a story of my life. Uh, most of the time it's been disastrous, but in this one case I am ever grateful to Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, uh, my great regret is I never met her. But in 1962, when I took my job at the University of Alberta, she published Silent Spring, all about the unexpected effects of pesticides. Now you have to think back to that period. In 1962, there wasn't a single department of the environment in any government on the planet. The word environment just didn't mean in 1962 what we have come to understand its meaning today. In 1962, well, we had thought that pesticides were one of the greatest inventions of scientific expertise. When Paul Mueller discovered in the 30s that DDT kills insects and didn't seem to harm mammals, it was hailed as this great discovery. Paul Mueller won a Nobel Prize for the discovery in 1948. But it was Rachel Carson who said, look, there are effects that you can see that the birds have gone silent. Something is going wrong as a result of all of our excess use of pesticides. She wasn't against pesticides, but it was the, the scale and the, uh, and, uh, well, this, just the scale of its use uh, in the environment. And um, because of Rachel Carson, the world changed. I mean, she set off, in my book, uh, she began the modern environmental movement. But for me, as a scientist, as I read her book, I was blown away by the realization that, yes, science is a very powerful way of knowing. We focus on a part of nature. We ignore everything else. We look at a, a, a gene or an atom or a, or, or a subatomic particle. And then we acquire tremendous insights into that isolated piece of nature. I was a fruit fly geneticist. And uh, we, used, we didn't care about fruit flies. We used to call them flying bags of chromosomes because we were only interested in the chromosomes. But in focusing in this reductionist approach of science, we lose sight of the context within which that part of nature was interesting in the first place. And you, you lose sight of the interconnectivity of everything in the real world. And so yes, you can spray, you can show DDT works great in a Florence flask or a growth chamber or even out in an open field. But it rains, the wind blows, it snows, all kinds of things happen. And guess what? You end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. And it was that recognition for me 
that science gives you a part of an insight, but it doesn't look at the big, it can't see the bigger picture. That to me was a very powerful lesson as a scientist. And the other thing I realized was that by going for the apparent huge benefit of pesticides, and quite frankly to me pesticides have got to be the dumbest way that we have to control pests. I mean we spray insecticides for example that kill all insects just to get at the one or two species that might be a pest to us in a farmer's field. That's crazy to kill all insects just to get it. I mean that would be like saying we've got a problem of crime in Vancouver let's kill everybody in the city. Yeah you get rid of crime. It sounds pretty stupid to me as a way of managing crime but we've bought into the pesticide uh, uh, game. Uh, last year I think we used six billion pounds of pesticides uh, around the world. But the other aspect that I, I realized in, in uh, reading Silent Spring was that we don't know enough to even anticipate the long-term consequences of many of our discoveries. It was only when Americans began to observe bald eagles were disappearing that biologists tracked it down and discovered a phenomenon we didn't even know about called biomagnification. You spray in parts per million, that's concentrated at, by microorganisms and at each level up the food chain you concentrate it. So when you get to the fatty tissue of the breasts of women or the shell glands of birds, you've concentrated DDT hundreds of thousands of times. Now we know that biomagnification is a biological phenomenon, but we only discovered it as a consequence of using vast amounts of DDT. When nuclear atomic bombs were dropped on Japan in 1945, we didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. We discovered that when bombs were tested over bikini years later. We didn't know there were electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays that knock out electrical circuits. We didn't know there was a concept of nuclear winter. All of these implications or impacts of technology we discovered long after. Same with CFCs. I mean, so we thought CFCs are great. They're big ring molecules with a lot of chlorine on them but for some reason they are chemically inert. They don't react with anything. And that's great. Why? Well, if you're going to put a spray can with perfume in it, you don't load the whole spray can with perfume. That's a waste. So what you do is you put a little amount of perfume in the bottom and then you load it up with something else. Well, if you put air in it, there's oxygen. Oxygen will oxidize and break down the perfume. But CFCs are great. They're big molecules, so you can fill it up easily and they're chemically inert. But then years later we began to use CFCs like mad and everything, you know, refrigerants and, and uh, uh, spray cans. And years later scientists realized, my God, they persist, they don't react chemically and break down, they persist and they're floating higher and higher and high up, ultraviolet light from the sun breaks chlorine free radicals and chlorine scavenges ozone. When I first heard CFCs were scavenging ozone, my response was, I didn't even know there was an ozone layer up there. I mean, over and over again, we know so little that we can't anticipate the impact of powerful technologies. So, I, uh, the, the environmental movement exploded as a result of Rachel Carson's uh, uh, book. And by 1972, in only 10 years, uh, the first major conference on the environment was held in Stockholm and there the United Nations Environment Program uh, was established and uh, uh, people like Paul Ehrlich and uh, Lady Barbara Ward, uh, uh, Barry Commoner, there were a lot of people there raising a lot of the issues that we're still dealing with today. But um, in uh, 1979, uh, well, as a result of that movement, of course, it was tremendous success. We got departments of the environment, we got laws to protect air and water, endangered species, and millions of hectares of, of land were protected as parks or reserves. In 1979, I got a letter from Jim Fulton, who was a member of parliament for, for Skeena up north, and it said, Suzuk, you should do a show on the Battle of Verlogging Windy, at Windy Bay. And 
my response was, where's Windy Bay? What battle over logging? <coughs> so we went up, and of course, that's ultimately where we met Charlene, up to uh, Haida Gwaii, and I decided to do a program on the battle over logging at Windy Bay. And so we interviewed loggers and forestry executives. We interviewed environmentalists, politicians. Uh, we interviewed Haida. And uh, one of the people I interviewed was a young Haida artist named Gu Zhao, who had been part of the leadership in the battle against logging for many years. And, and I knew that the Haida had a very high level of unemployment and that many of the loggers were Haida. So I interviewed Guj, I said, why are you fighting against logging? It's adding economic value to your community. I said, you know, those loggers, they go and shop in the, in the stores and things you have in, in Skidigit and Masset. Uh, why are you opposed to the logging? And he said, yeah, when the trees are, are, are all gone, we'll still be here. But then I guess we'll be like everybody else. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And it was only when we got back to Vancouver and I started to look at the rushes and I thought, that is a weird statement. And what it said to me he, was that he was opening a window on a radically different way of looking at the world. To be Haida meant to be connected to the, to the land, that the air, the water, the fish, the trees, all of that is what make the Haida who they are, their history, their culture, the very reason why Haida are on this, on this earth is told to them by their connection to the land. Remove that, yes, physically they'll still be here. But they'll lose all of that sense of who they are as people uh, of the land. And for me, that changed the way I, I saw the whole environmental uh, problem. And in the years, we did a show in 1981 uh, on the battle over Windy Bay. It got the biggest rating of any program the, the the Nature of Things had ever run. The Nature of Things started as a series in 1960. I, I took it over the, as the uh, host in 1979. But um, the Canadians responded to that film in a, in a way that had never been seen by the nature of things. Over the years, in the battles, I've uh, worked with Miles Richardson and Gu Zhao and many others uh, in the Haida community. And over the years, we celebrated many victories. There was a proposal to drill for oil in Hecate Strait. I remember testifying with James Gosnell, the great Niska leader, and fighting against the proposal to drill for oil in a very, very uh, uh, uncertain area of Hecate Strait. And we stopped it. The Americans wanted, in Alaska, wanted to get to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, they call it ANWR. And that is the calving grounds of the porcupine caribou herd. And so we knew that this was coming up as a, as a rider in a piece of legislation. The Nature of Things did a program uh, on the caribou herd in uh, Anwar. And I like to think we were part of the reason why it was stopped. But then it came up again, and we did another film. We ended up doing three films, and, I, the, and Trump has now added... Uh, a rider to a bill that has just passed again, and I think this time they will, in fact, go in and drill um, in in Anwar. But we celebrated stopping it year after year. There was a proposal to bring oil from the north slope of Alaska through British Columbia waters down to Seattle to be refined. David Anderson was a leader of the liberals, uh, the provincial liberals, when they were really liberals, not conservatives. And thanks to David and many others. We stopped that proposal. And in, uh, we uh, joined up with the Kayapo in, in Brazil and, and stopped a proposal to build a dam at Altamira. And I almost drowned uh, going for a demonstration up in, uh, in uh, peace country when our canoe overturned and uh, we were fighting the, the dam at Site C and we stopped it. Well, of course, 30 to 40 years later, you know what happened. Those same battles we celebrated as victories were fighting again. And so I've been saying for a number of years that we environmentalists failed. We fundamentally failed to shift the way that we see the world. So we're still battling because the same forces are coming in wanting to continue the, the battle against Mother Earth. 
And we are not going to get out of this until we change uh, the mindset, the way that we see the world. And the question is, how the hell did we get to this point? When we have become such a powerful force on the planet, and yet we are so destructive on Earth. So, I, uh, every culture, you know, has its creation or origin stories. And science is now contributing to the origin stories. But these stories go way back beyond human memory. I'm a scientist, a geneticist, and I've been intrigued by the way that DNA, the genetic material, can be used to track the movement of people across the planet. And all of the trails lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. That's where we were born as a species. And I'm waiting for an invite by the Ku Klux Klan so that I can tell them, what the hell is your problem? We're all Africans, for Christ's sake. <laughs> that's where we were born, and that's where we belong. And you know, if you try to think going back 150,000 years and looking at our birthplace, it was an area filled with animals in abundance and variety beyond anything you would see in the Serengeti today. You'd have to look really hard to spot those clumps of three, four, or five funny-looking, two-legged, furless apes. And that was us. And seen in that context, you got to say, I am sure no other species said to its kid, shh, shh don't, don't piss that guy off. They're going to take over the planet. I mean, there weren't many of us. We weren't big. We weren't fast. We weren't strong. We didn't have special sensory abilities. Like, who the hell would have thought that this naked ape would have such a future to become the Anthropocene drivers? Well, of course, the reason you couldn't see it is our secret was invisible. It was a two-kilogram organ buried deep in our skulls. The brain was our leg up. The brain conferred a massive memory. No other animal on the planet has a memory capacity of a human brain. The brain made us curious. We were observant. We did things and learned by trial and error. We, uh, uh, we were inventive. And all of these qualities then of the human brain allowed us to acquire an ability that no other creature has ever had. And that brain did something that no other species has done. It invented an idea, an idea called the future. The future doesn't exist, right? I mean, the only thing that exists is now and what we can remember from the past. But because we invented the idea of a future, we're the only animal that realized we can shape or affect the future by what we do today. Knowing what we know. You know, it's something as simple as going down a, a trail and it suddenly forks into two, into two, and you go, well, I, I remember going down that way, and I ran in, into a saber-toothed tiger. But when I went to the left, I found something good to smoke, I mean, eat. And uh, so I'm, I'm going left. And that was what we did as human beings. We used our acquired knowledge, and we encountered situations where we could see where there were dangers and see where there were opportunities, and we could deliberately choose today to avoid the dangers and exploit the opportunities. I believe foresight was one of the great achievements of our species that gave us a huge leg up and enabled us uh, to, to reach the position we're at. And the irony, of course, of our time now is that we have all of the amplified brain power and predictive capacity of scientists, of supercomputers, and for over 40 years, the leading scientists of the world have been telling us we're going down a very dangerous path, that there are opportunities by taking a different turn. And for 40 years, we've been denying the very strategy that got us as a species to where we are today, because now politics and economics intrude on making those decisions. We. Um, so we, we, um, we began as a species in Africa. That was our home. But for some reason that's not really fully understood, we started to move out of our home. 
probably there was a bit of population growth. Probably we depleted certain resources. I like to think it was teenage boys looking for action on the other side of a mountain. You know, we bred with Neanderthals, so maybe they were checking out the Neanderthal girls on the other side of a mountain. I don't know. But for some reason, we began to move into new areas. And where we came to new areas, we were an invasive species. We didn't know how it all worked. Here were these birds without any wings, and they were big and easy to catch, and they were yummy to eat. Great! And, uh, you know, we took giant sloths, they moved slowly. We could, we, even with stone axes and spears, we were a very effective predator. And now, as you follow the movement of humans across the planet, you see a wave of extinction that followed our movement, because we were an, a very effective predator, and that wave of extinction, I believe, was what was driving us constantly searching for new resources. So as people began to realize, geez, there aren't as many flightless birds as there used to be, you know, like, uh, and we got to depend on them. What the hell are we going to do? And of course, the drive then to move on to a different place. But some people said, no, I like it here. I'm staying here. We have to live differently. And I believe that's the root, the roots of indigenous people all over the planet. People who said, I'm staying. We've got to act in a way that shows more respect for where we're living. And as they learn from their elders the mistakes, the things that worked, their failures, those were all life lessons that were embodied in the knowledge of indigenous people. And those lessons are priceless. They will never be duplicated by science. So the loss of every culture, every language, which embodies that thousands of years of knowledge, is a tragedy every bit as great as the loss of another animal species. We should be fighting to preserve those cultures and those languages because they, they have acquired that knowledge through very hard-won life lessons, and they will never be replicated by science. So, what is, uh, I kind of lost my, um, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to say that indigenous people around the world are the only groups with a track record of having lived sustainably in place for thousands of years. No other groups have demonstrated that, that, uh, that ability because, you know, if you look at the 500 years of colonization, uh, not just in Canada, but around the world, you see a totally different mindset in terms of uh, the occupation uh, of new lands. And that mindset has been incredibly destructive. We, um, we now, in all of our discussions, in whether it's over pipelines or uh, dams or tar sands or fossil fuels or fish farms, uh, the economy and jobs come to be a very powerful uh, part of the discussion. And we forget a very simple thing. The very word economics is based on the Greek word ekos, meaning household or domain. The same word that ecology is built on. So ecology is the, now ecos is home, home or domain. Ecology is the study of our home. And what ecologists try to do is determine what are the conditions, the laws, the principles that govern a species' ability to survive over long periods of time. Not a bad bit of information. Economics is the management of the household. And I would have thought any economist would go first and say, wait a minute, what are those ecologies, ecologists telling us? Because whatever we do, we can't screw around with those principles or those laws. But when we had a prime minister, for example, Mr. Harper, who said, we can't do anything about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that'll destroy the economy. He elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather and climate. This is suicidal. The economy, after all, is a human construct. It's not a force of nature. Yet we constantly try to force nature to fit. We shoehorn nature into our agenda, our human constructs. And it doesn't make any sense to me at all. 
We, um, let, me, let me give you a couple of, ex couple of stories that will illustrate the problem. The first is uh, back in the 1980s, I think, or maybe it was 70s, the Laka Pamuks people in Lytton called me and asked if I would help them prevent logging in the Stein Valley. The Stein Valley was theirs and they considered it sacred and they didn't want logging to take place. So uh, BC had given Fletcher Challenge, a New Zealand forest company, a permit to log the Stein Valley. So I agreed and uh, I met the CEO of Fletcher Challenge. And needless to say, what started off as, uh, oh, hello, how are you, quickly escalated into a shouting match. And finally, in frustration, he said, listen, Suzuki, are tree huggers like you willing to pay for those trees? Because if you're not willing to pay for them, they don't have any value till someone cuts them down. And that, for me, was a very important moment because I realized he was right. In our economic system, those trees only had value when either environmentalists or someone paid money to keep from logging them or if loggers go in and cut them down. And I said to him, yeah, but to the Nlaka Pomics people, that valley is sacred. How do you put something that's sacred into the economic equation? Of course, there's nothing in the economy for something that is sacred. And then you think, we're fighting for those, that, that uh, valley as an ecosystem. As long as the forests are standing and healthy, they're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting oxygen back in. Not a bad service. I mean, if all the green things in the oceans and on land weren't doing that, we wouldn't be here. So I said to the, the guy, the uh, CEO, I said, but what about the photosynthesis? And when you cut those trees down, you lose all that. And his answer was, ah, that's an externality. That's got nothing to do with the economy. So. What the forest is doing, the services performed by the forest, holding soil so when it rains, it doesn't spoil the salmon spawning beds, uh, transpiring water out of the soil and into the air, modulating weather and climate, providing habitat for insects and fungi and birds and, and mammals. All of these services that the, the forest performs are in our economic system irrelevant because they're externalities. And so this is, I t testified in front of the Commission on Site C last week, and I said, you know, you're charged with only looking at the economic uh, considerations of Site C. That it's, a lo it's, a, it's a loaded game. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's already foretold because it ain't gonna, the, the ecological issues and matters don't factor in when you just look at the uh, economy. So that was a lesson one for me, that the economic system doesn't account for the most important services that uh, wilderness performs around the world. So the second story is, how long can I go on? <laughs> uh, I, four years ago, I got a call from a CEO of one of the largest oil companies in the tar sands. And he said, could I come down and talk? I said, yes, of course, I'm not into fighting. Come down, I'd be honored. The next morning he showed up at my door and I, you know, I did the whole, I'm thrilled, I'm so happy, thank you, blah, blah, what an honor. And then I said, look, I want you to do me one favor. Before you come through the door, I want you to leave your identity as a CEO outside the door. I want to meet you as one human being to another. Because quite frankly, Mr. CEO, I don't see the point of discussing other things, oil and climate and all that, until we start from a platform of agreement. Otherwise, we're all over the map, but let's start with a fundamental platform of agreement. Then we can negotiate these other things. Well, I could tell from his body language this was not what he came down to see me about, but to his credit, he came through the door. So he sat down, I said, look, I know this is not not what you expected, so let me tell you what I mean. I said, we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature, and there's nothing you can do about them. We live within those laws. And I said, in physics, you know you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. That's the limit, and we live with that. 
The law of gravity says if I trip on this, off this stage, I'm going to fall and hit my head in the floor. That's gravity. And the first and second laws of thermodynamics tell us you can't build a perpetual motion machine. Those are all dictated to us by laws of physics. Chemistry, it's the same. The atomic property of the elements determines the melting points, the freezing points, the boiling points, reaction rates and diffusion constants. All of those things are settled or set by laws of chemistry. And chemists live within the dictates of what they can or cannot synthesize in a test tube. That's chemistry. Biology, it's the same. Every species has a maximum number that can be sustained indefinitely. And that's determined by what's called the carrying capacity of an ecosystem or a habitat. So if you go beyond that number, your population is going to crash. Now humans just say, well, we don't have a habitat or an ecosystem. We're smart. We adapt to many different conditions. It's true. But the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, that's our home. And it can only sustain so many human beings. And the number of humans it can sustain, of course, are dictated by our numbers and our per capita consumption. Put those two together and you can determine what can be sustained on Earth. And every scientist I've talked to agrees we're way past the sustainable number. Even if we all lived like Bangladeshis or Somalias, Somalians, there are way too many people to be sustained uh, indefinitely. But the major factor driving the destruction of the, the biosphere is us in the rich countries because you have to factor in our numbers and our per capita consumption. And by that criterion, we are the vastly overpopulated country. So, you know, I hate it when I hear, oh, Canada's a big country with a small population. Yeah, but with a gigantic footprint because most of Canada is buried under ice, snow, and rock. The, so um, the carrying capacity is dictated as a, a law of, of biology. And biology says we are animals. And I, I didn't realize what a contentious statement that is. I gave a talk to the uh, first annual Green Building uh, Conference in Austin, Texas in the 1990s. And I said, there were 3,000 people in the audience, a lot of children. I said, now kids, if you remember one thing from my speech, Remember, we are animals. My God, did their parents get pissed off at me? Woman came up, don't you call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. I said, Madam, I'm sorry, but if your daughter isn't an animal, is she a plant? Because we're biological creatures, I'm sorry. And as, as animals, I said to the CEO, what is the most important thing every human being needs? And instead of giving me the, animal, uh, the answer, as any child would, he goes, well, um, and I could see he's thinking, job, money. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So I hope you can agree with me. Clean air should be considered sacred. It should be something that we all are committed to protecting because it gives us life and health. And then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water by weight. We're just a big blob of water with enough thickener added. We don't dribble away on the floor. But, you know, the body leaks water, right? It comes out of your skin and your mouth and your eyes and your crotch and you, you lose water. And you have to top up every day. If you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink contaminated water, you're sick. So, Mr. CEO, wouldn't you put clean water along with clean air as sacred and something that all of us have to protect? And then I said, food's different. We can go a lot longer, and some of us a lot longer. Uh, but sooner, sooner or later, we're going to die. I said, four to six weeks without food, you die. And contaminated food, you sicken. Most of our food is grown in the soil. So would you not agree that clean soil and food joins clean water and clean air. And finally, I said all of the energy in your body, in all of the energy that we need to do work, to grow, to move, to reproduce, all of that is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis 
converted into chemical energy, and then we get it by eating the plants or the animals that eat the plants, and we store it in our bodies. And when we need to do work or move, we burn those molecules of energy and liberate the sunlight back out in our bodies. So photosynthesis joins clean soil and food, clean water, and clean air. And I said, Mr. CEO, the final miracle of life on Earth is that those four elements that indigenous people around the world refer to as Earth, air, fire, and water coming from the body of Mother Earth, those four sacred elements are cleansed, replenished, created by the web of living things that indigenous people call our brothers and sisters. It's the plants of the world in the ocean and on land that capture all of the energy that we use, that also has in the past captured the energy in fossil fuels, in dung, in peat, in wood. Those are all sunlight stored in, uh, in those fuels, and we liberate the sun's energies by burning them. So photosynthesis is given to us by all the green things. When water, you know in Vancouver, we get our water from three watersheds surrounded by old growth rainforest. And when it rains, the tree roots and the other plant roots and soil fungi and microorganisms filter the water. You don't have to do anything to that water. You can, I know you say, well, fish shit in the water. Yeah, but it, there, it's all taken care of. We could drink that water straight away. And so it's life that is part of the hydrologic cycle and filters it for us. Life creates the soil without, you know, Matt Damon stranded on Mars and he's got a year's worth of potatoes, but he's got to wait four years for to get rescued. What the hell is he going to do? How do you convert a year's worth of potatoes into four years? There's no soil. Remember, there's lots of dust and sand and gravel. So he had to dig a little hole and put some poop in it and return some organic material to it. Life creates the soil on which we grow our food. And every bit of the food that we eat was once alive. So I said, Mr. CEO, this, I believe, should be the foundation of every society on Earth. That air, water, soil, biodiversity, and energy, sunlight, should be sacred and should be the highest priority for, for protecting. I said, other things, capitalism, that's not some force of nature. I mean, communism, uh, governments, political parties, corporations, markets, currency, these are not force, forces of nature. And yet we bow down before them as if somehow they're, 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 they are like forces of nature. They're human constructs. And yet we're constantly putting our constructs above everything else and then asking nature to try to fit those constructs and, and boundaries, another human boundaries we draw around things. So I said the only way we can, we can come to, to meet the ecological crisis we face is putting those elements as the foundation of the way we live, work and play. And then we must find ways of building economies, uh, places that we live and places that we play and all of those other things, but never threatening the rock-solid foundation of the way that, of uh, life's needs, basic needs. I said, Mr. CEO, if you would shake hands with me and agree with what I've just said, I will do everything I can to help you and your company. Now, what do you think he did? Of course, he couldn't. He couldn't. If he went back to his shareholders and said, well, I had a discussion with Suzuki and I have to agree, we can't do anything that's going to mess with the air, water, and soil. He'd get fired in a picosecond. That's not his job. And to do that would destroy his way of making a living. And so this is the dilemma we face. We're not, I believe, going to get out of it if we don't come together and all establish a foundation of total agreement on what our fundamental needs are and then realize that we have the creativity of living in balance with those things as indigenous people have for so long a period. In the 1990s, you remember that uh, China 
uh, Hong Kong was going to revert to China. And there was a lot of nervousness about what was the fate of the Hong Kong people. I've lived in the same house in Vancouver for 45 years. And uh, back in the 1990s, I get a letter from a real estate agent saying, offshore money is pouring into Vancouver. Now is a good time to sell your house and buy up. I'd never heard the expression buying up. I didn't know that houses, you know, you start with a, st a starter house and then you uh, get a bigger house and then a bigger house. I didn't know that's what you did because I bought this property as the first investment my wife and I did after we got married and it was my home. It wasn't real estate or property, it was my home. And I thought, if you were asking me to put my home on the market, what are the things that I would put down that give it its value? And the first thing I put down was that when I got married, uh, I fell in love with my wife's mother and dad. And I said, look, when you retire, please come and live with us. And I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. Never dreamed they'd live as long as they did. <laughs> the dad. The dad died at, at 95 three years ago, and the mom died last year at 97. But I, that was a wonderful thing because my children had grandma and granddad upstairs their entire lives, and I put that down. That's what made it my home. My uh, father-in-law was an avid gardener, of course, and uh, he was an Englishman, and uh, he knew I loved uh, raspberries and uh, asparagus and... Uh, I was in the United States on a tour for a month and I came home and the first person I met was my father-in-law with a brown bag. He said, David, this is the asparagus and I saved the first batch for you because it's, it belongs to you. And I put that down. My children over the years have dragged, there's roadkill in Vancouver, believe it or not. They've dragged dead snakes and birds and squirrels and rats and they have a little animal cemetery under the dogwood tree, and I put that down. My father was a cabinet maker, and he, when Tar and I were married, he built a kitchen cabinet for our first apartment. When we bought the house, I tore the cabinet out and put it in our kitchen. Looks like hell, it doesn't belong, but every time I open the door, I think of my father, and I put that down. And along the, the fence, there's a clematis plant, and when my mother died in 1984, I put her ashes on that. And when my niece Janice died prematurely early, uh, I put Janice's ashes on that. And every year when that clematis blooms, I know that my mother and my niece are there. And I put that down. And those and many other things I listed are what made that property my home. And to me, they are priceless. You can't put a value on it but on the market they're worthless and that's the problem we face. The things that matter most have no place in our economic system and yet we constantly use the economy as the driving force and we celebrate. You know the price of renewable energy is just dropping so rapidly. We shouldn't even be in that game of talking about the economy. We're talking about what's happening to Mother Earth and those economists have got to conform in whatever way they can. The things that matter most are not valued in a system that looks to the economy as the source of everything that matters. And this is why I'd just like to end by thanking the Tsleil-Waututh for clinging despite all of the things that have happened over the last 150 years. I celebrate the 150th year. I celebrate that you're still here after all of that. Thank you. Thank you for hanging out here.